So it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, uh, this discussion on the topic of CAR T-cells. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the world of cancer immunotherapy is in the midst of a remarkable explosion. Um, multiple technologies have come to the fore, and what is so striking uh, to many is the combination of the fact that this is science-driven technology. This, these are technologies that have not, um, through random uh, experimentation, happened to yield uh, significant results, but these are hypothesis-driven approaches that have a, a deep rationale behind them on the one hand, and on the other, they are having massive and, in many cases, permanent impact, long-term, stable, disease-free survival in significant populations of patients, um, far from the proportion of patients that we need to see these therapies work in. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this combination of rational, scientific, and hypothesis-driven methods uh, to produce major clinical results um, represents an opportunity for us not only to understand exactly what the nuances is of how they work, but the nuances of how they are failing to work and how we can improve on these therapies. So one of the very important breakthroughs has been the engineering of, of T cells to attack in a fashion that is, in a sense, designed um, and, in a, in a sense, uh, capable of mediating all of the magnificent biology of the immune system, but through an engineered fashion, targeting the malignant cells wherever they may reside within the body. Um, and this is uh, a branch of this, an important branch of this, is the field of CAR T-cell therapy in cancer. So we have a, a fantastic group of, of panelists today, and what we'd like to do first is to go through and, and have each person introduce themselves, and then we'll begin with our discussion, and we'll begin with Oz. Hi, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Oz Azem, and I have the privilege to lead the cell and gene therapies business at Novartis Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Mark Frolish, head of uh, portfolio strategy at Juno Therapeutics, based in Seattle, uh, medical oncologist by training. Um, Marcella Moss, I'm a medical oncologist by training and director of cellular immunotherapy at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center. Great. Uh, Chuck Wilson, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, President CEO of Unum Therapeutics. Great. So I thought before we dig into the uh, complexities and opportunities and challenges of CAR T therapy, um, maybe to sort of level the playing field and, and call on the academic colleague of mine who's sitting here in the panel, Marcella, um, I thought maybe we would ask her to give a, a two, two and a half minute or so um, summary of what exactly we mean by CAR T cells and the use of this modality in cancer therapeutics. Marcella. Sure, thanks, David. Um, so if we're thinking about uh, cancer moonshots these days, I guess I would say that the T, the T cell part of this is, is the actual rocket. Um, if you think about it as a war on cancer, these are the soldiers. These are the people who are actually the boots on the ground. Um, and what I mean by that is that the, the T cells are the arm of the immune system that can recognize uh, viruses, uh, they can recognize infected cells, and they can also recognize cancer cells. Um, sometimes, though, they're not very good at recognizing cancer, and that's why clinically uh, cancer happens. It's not always rejected by the immune system. Sometimes it's a matter of taking off the brakes on those T cells, and that's really what checkpoint blockade does. Um, but in some cancers, even if you take off the brakes, the T cells still need to know where to go, um, who to kill, who to find, um, and we want that to be the tumor. Um, so we've now, um, really over the last 20 years, scientists have been able to figure out how to genetically modify those T cells so that we can redirect them specifically to a particular tumor or a particular antigen. And there's a couple of ways of engineering the T cells to do that. Um, one is to use a, a natural T cell receptor. That's how they normally recognize uh, cells that are infected with a virus. Um, but there's also newer um, ways of doing it, which include chimeric antigen receptors, and that's what we call CARs, and we all kind of have fun with the, with the acronym. Um, but chimeric antigen receptors are synthetic molecules that really take uh, the one part of the immune system, which is your antibodies, and fuse them to become T cell receptors. So it fuses them with um, the signaling molecules of a T cell receptor. And that's a very powerful uh, approach because you can redirect the T cell uh, to recognize a particular target the way an antibody does, but kill and persist and have memory 
the way that a T cell does. Um, TCRs and CARs are not even the only ways that one can redirect T cells. There's also uh, sort of universal antigen receptors that one can use where then you can paint uh, a particular target on the T cell and it will go and find that, that particular tumor based on that target. Um, some of the, the beauty of the system is that it really uses the patient's own immune system. Um, then one of the challenges with it is the logistics of taking the T cells um, out of a patient, genetically modifying them in the lab, and then putting them back into the patient. And even though it's kind of beautiful um, scientifically, it can sometimes be uh, clinically a little bit more complicated. Um, and so this has really been a field that's been developed in multiple academic centers over the last 15 years or so, um, and really just in the last five years has become a, a commercial endeavor once, once its power has really been realized. Great, thank you very much. So I thought what I would do is begin uh, by posing some questions to our panelists and, uh, and uh, initiate our discussion to hear their perspectives uh, and share them with, with the group. Uh, so the first question I have is, um, by way of background, immunotherapy in general and cell-based therapy specifically has ignited the investing world in a historic way. Can cell-based can cell-based therapies live up to this enormous set of expectations? Uh, what are the strengths? What are the challenges? Already Marcella mentioned certain ones. Um, do we think it's likely that, that the CAR T-cell approach will be able to, to live up to this enormous set of expectations? Mark. Yeah. So uh, the reason I'm optimistic is that we're already beginning to get a, a fair understanding of some of the mechanisms of resistance, so particularly in the hematologic malignancies. And, and I think we have some eminently testable hypotheses that have a reasonable probability of success. Uh, so in the hematologic malignancies, for example, the two major mechanisms of resistance are that the cells simply aren't persisting long enough. Uh, and the second mechanism is if they are persisting, oftentimes the tumor develops, uh, downregulates the antigen, so-called antigen escape. Uh, and so for the first of those, one of the things that we know is limiting persistence is an immune response against the transgene. Um, and so one of the things that we and others are working on are making fully human binding domains. Currently, most of the CD19 CAR T cells in late stage development or in fact, all of them have, are derived from mouse antibodies, uh, which are obviously uh, highly immunogenic. Um, so that's one thing that we can clearly test. The other, in terms of antigen escape, is to target more than one antigen. So in B-cell malignancies, we, for example, are targeting not just CD19, but CD22, with a potential to treat with CD22 CAR on relapse, or more attractively, really treat upfront in combination with both to pre pre prevent the outgrowth of that relapse. And then the third uh, mechanism, which we've seen less, although have seen anecdotes and probably will be more operative in the solid tumor setting, um, is, um, is, is a situation where the cells persist, there's still antigen available, and presumably those cells are somehow um, becoming uh, immunosuppressed by the, the tumor microenvironment. And there again, I think we'll talk probably more in this panel. There, we now have many levers to pull in terms of um, agents that are approved or in development that we can combine with CAR T cells. Um, that I think have a high probability of, of clearly making a difference, particularly in solid tumors. Mm -hmm. So if I could just add on to what Mark said, because he, he laid the foundation really well, that um, expectations, uh, it's still a young field, but it's a field that's evolved very, very quickly. And I think some of the, the triggers for that have been the ability to move from primarily what was pioneering science done at an academic level and being able to actually start to scale up those academic processes uh, to a point where they can become sustainable and scalable uh, and reliable for patients. And as Mike, Mark rightly pointed out, that the beachhead forming really has happened with heme malignancies, particularly CD19 tumors. And so there is now a wealth of data that I think is starting to demonstrate very attractive benefit risks for these platforms. Um, and dare I say it, potentially, uh, and I use the word very cautiously, uh, potentially curative uh, for certain malignancies. And I think if you look at it from that perspective, then certainly leading to potential cures, the value proposition uh, for such agents, I think, has tremendous value in terms of patients, clearly, but also healthcare systems and providers. Um, but I think collectively, those of us in the field are super excited, but we also know there are a number of challenges still yet to be overcome. Um, I think amazing progress has been made over the past couple of years on really the clinical scientific foundations, linking that back to manufacturing science. Uh, and now we're getting tantalizingly close where the real 
proof of concept is to be tested out with regulators where a number of uh, companies are going to be going forward with formal filings, not just in the US, but around the globe. Uh, we're starting to treat patients around the world in international multi-center trials. Uh, and a lot more investment is now starting to happen in the manufacturing basis of getting these therapies to be beyond just an academic offering, which was uh, a phenomenal start, but now taking this to the next level of evolution. So high expectations, and I think we're all very cautiously optimistic that this potentially could be another pillar of medicine to complement small molecules and biologics. So maybe just by way of background, we can um, give our audience a sense of just how high the expectations are for CD19-directed CAR T cells. Right? So in, in relapsed renal refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia, uh, multiple centers are seeing uh, remission rates on the order of 90% or more. Um, and some of them are durable out to more than three years, and uh, in other lymphomas out to more than five years. Uh, with a single infusion, uh, or perhaps one or two infusions in some cases. Um, and so really a, a very, um, you know, not an iterative treatment, but something that you can do once and, and then you're potentially done. Um, and with no evidence of minimal residual disease, no further therapy, no further interventions, and really being able to go back to your normal life. And so I think that's where some of the excitement and, and power is. And yeah, I, I, I can happily count myself as part of the extremely enthusiastic um, <laughs> part of the panel. Um, I should say before um, starting UNAM, I had the pleasure of leading the partnering group at Novartis. Um, and one of the deals we did there was our relationship with the University of Pennsylvania to get the um, Novartis and, and Penn working together to develop CAR-Ts. And I have to say, in the six years I was at Novartis, there was no other therapy remotely like the CAR-T in terms of the um, response rate, in terms of the durability of response. And I think we're all you know, extremely optimistic of sort of building upon the initial success that we've seen in the B-cell uh, malignancies, specifically with CD19. I, I think if there's a, a challenge or, or sort of a question for the future, it's you know, how, um, how much can we generalize from the uh, targeting CD19? Um, it's, clear, it's a fantastic target. It's clearly had de demonstrated remarkable um, activity, and we're seeing those sort of early academic efforts moving very quickly to market. I think if there's a question, it's can we use the platform technology more broadly across a much wider range of indications going after other targets? Um, and there you have to look at some of the lessons from other targeted therapies like antibody drug conjugates where there clearly have been successes, but also a lot of challenges. And I think um, in many ways um, we can build off that experience, but there's still uh, a lot to be sorted out. Great. Thanks very much. Along those lines, maybe I can sort of extend to uh, another question, which is to ask, what is the competitive landscape at the moment? So if, if we think about uh, immunotherapy broadly, um, this is one very exciting and important modality. Um, there also are immune checkpoint inhibitors. There are adoptive transfer T cell type therapies. There are a bunch of other therapies. What, what is the competitive landscape, would you say, um, for people who are looking at the broad portfolio of, of modalities that exist in, in cancer immunotherapy? And where does CAR-T fit into that, would you say? So maybe I'll take a start and get the ball rolling on this <laughs> one. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is a, a discrete but very important pillar within the, the immuno-oncology space. Clearly, PD-1 inhibitors uh, are now, have now come of age. We're seeing some very, very compelling results, particularly when you look at uh, lung cancer um, and, and you look at the investments by companies like BMS and Pfizer. Um, but you also see that with those indications, we're still scratching the surface. There's a huge area of unmet need uh, on the immuno-oncology portfolio side. And certainly, most of us that are working in the field would, I think, believe that from a hematological malignancy perspective, this certainly has the makings of, of, of a dream therapy in many ways. Um, Marcella rightly pointed out uh, the, the amazing complete responses. I mean, you work a, a, wait a lifetime to see clinical data of that magnitude to see the type of responses that all of us are in the field seeing uh, with the different sponsors that are working on these therapies. So there's no question in terms of the, the, the benefit there. Um, clearly, these are new modalities. There's also risk involved cytokine release and other things that we have to manage from an immunotherapy perspective. But in terms of um, the competition itself, let's face it, I mean, we, we see this as an emerging field that can form a credible beachhead for certain patient types. So uh, managing expectations, as I said before, is important. We are, most of us are targeting refractory relapsing populations who've gone through uh, cycles of treatment, have, have seen 
um, some benefit previously but then relapsed. And we're all hoping that these therapies are going to then provide sustained and durable responses, that they truly can be um, curative in that regard. I think also we're focusing on looking at this um, as well from the, the endpoint perspective in that um, these are patients who their alternatives are bone marrow transplant in many cases from a heme malignancy perspective. So we are really trying to focus to see can we supplant and replace bone marrow transplant, not necessarily be a bridge to transplant, although that may be the case that uh, the field may end up in. But clearly we see a value proposition where we want to see this as added value and curative therapies. We also know that in the field there are other competitive, comp competitor assets coming out, not just on the cell therapy side, but small molecules as well. Um, so uh, if we look at biologics, uh, I mean, biotechnologies, for example, blinitumab, other agents have come uh, very quickly in the past few years, and we expect further um, signs to be coming uh, from that specific area. And then all of us are heavily vested that we see the CART therapies right now as version 1.0. Uh, all of us are pretty passionate about the next phase of innovation that's going to come. And Mark touched on it already in terms of pipeline carts and looking at alternative targets because we know not every patient will have a persistence and durable response. So developing a, a portfolio. And with that, combining that very importantly is understanding again the manufacturing base because you're not providing a pill, you're not providing a biologic, you're providing an autologous cell therapy. And that has its own opportunities and challenges as well that Marcella highlighted. So uh, healthy competition, great opportunities for patients because we know that one shot on goal is probably going to be very difficult for treatment of most cancers. But certainly in hematological malignancies, I think we're very excited. There is the potential of a one shot goal for treating certain types of uh, malignancies. Any other thoughts on competitive landscape? In the immunotherapy area? I mean, just, just briefly sort of summarizing what does it look like. From my perspective, you've got T cell therapies that includes CARs and high affinity T cell receptors. You've got checkpoint inhibitors, and you've got bites. Um, and I think, you know, the, obviously the T cell therapies are intrinsically the most complex therapies that have probably ever been made. Um, but they have certain really unique properties that sets them apart from those other more traditional biologics approaches. You know, with the um, checkpoint inhibitors intrinsically, you are limited to the T cell repertoire in the patient. And as, as Marcella was outlining, if those T cells are not trained to go after the cancer, it's not obvious that derepressing them will ultimately sort of bring about, uh, bring about a therapeutic response. Similarly, with the bites, you, uh, you have a means basically of targeting T cells in the patient to the tumor. But if those T cells intrinsically um, are not the kinds of T cells you're looking for, if they're Tregs, if they're energic, if they are not trained to ultimately respond to the tumor, you're not going to get the kind of uh, response ultimately the CAR T's have been able to generate. And I think when you go to the trouble of taking T cells out of the patient, genetically modifying those T cells to allow them to hone to tumor, there are lots of other things you can do in terms of engineering that T cell to render it really um, supercharged to go after the tumor, be that you know, modifying with checkpoint um, uh, pathways, uh, other kinds of modifications that ultimately allow you to bring a very potent, sophisticated immune response to, to the tumor. I mean, and the other, I think, key features of T cells are they can traffic anywhere in the body. Um, they get to spaces like the CNS, where we can clear CNS leukemia, where you may have challenges with, uh, with uh, large molecules. Um, you know, they can auto-regulate so that they can expand based on the antigen burden. Um, they can form immunologic memory. Um, they can, you know, treat highly resistant tumors that are resistant to multiple other mechanisms. Um, um, so I think some of these other therapies share some of those properties, but none of them share all of those properties. I think that's one of the reasons that there's such an enthusiasm around using cells. So can we talk for a few minutes about CAR-T as a monotherapy versus combination therapies? Um, in what context do you think monotherapy may have its greatest efficacy, and what might be the strategies that we'll be looking at in the coming years for combinations where, where different indications, different combinatorial partners that might be used in, in those different settings. Any thoughts about that? So I think for, uh, for some diseases, monotherapy may be enough, like for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, I think for others, we'll, we'll kind of have to wait and see. Um, it's possible that there will be other hematologic... Why, why, would you, why, why do you think that is? Why would ALL stand out in that way? 
because you're, you're absolutely right. It looks this way. But it's yeah. great to know why that might be. Uh, I think that's a multi-million dollar question. Um, we don't know exactly uh, you know, what, what would make ALL more susceptible to CAR T cells than uh, a different lymphoma that also has the same target on it. Um, it, it may be related to tumor microenvironment. ALL is a disease of the bone marrow and the blood uh, more than lymph nodes or, or solid masses. And, uh, and we've seen with CAR T cells, at least uh, the ones that I've uh, worked on as part of uh, Penn, is that we're, we're very good at clearing uh, blood and bone marrow, and it takes longer sometimes to clear lymph nodes. And so we know that T cells can get into uh, masses. We've seen in, in studies in solid tumors that T cells can actually traffic into a tumor mass, but sometimes that takes longer and sometimes it's not as effective and sometimes they could be inhibited by the microenvironment. And so um, I think there's lots of reasons why ALL may be uh, uniquely susceptible to monotherapy. Um, that said, I think the fact that CAR T cells can go any, or that T cells can go anywhere, um, that really means that it's, it's a platform because you could imagine strapping things onto those T cells, uh, e either in the form of, you know, nano particle backpacks or secreting of new uh, antibodies or, or even chemotherapy drugs. And so, you know, as much as I, as I love the T cell as a, as a platform, I don't think that it's uh, necessarily going to be a monotherapy for all diseases. I think adding in uh, either small molecule drugs that enhance T cell function um, or that decrease uh, tumor suppression by the tumor uh, microenvironment or even adding checkpoint blockade to harness all the other antigens that are not being targeted by the specific chimeric antigen receptor. Those are all areas that are ripe for making this a, a platform for multiple different diseases. So yeah, I would agree with Marcella's um, thoughts, particularly around tumor microenvironment, because that's very clear from the work we've done with Penn, <laughs> um, that clearly there are um, phenotypical issues between patients, but clearly the microenvironment plays a huge role. And hematological malignancies are a very good first target and foray to go into this space. Um, I think when it comes to solid tumors and other targets, we still have a lot of work to do. So while the ubiquitous nature of T cells to be able to traffic is there, uh, no one has really demonstrated yet a, a clinical convincing proof of concept that in a solid tumor setting, for example, such as lung or brain, uh, glioblastoma, other tissues, while we get trafficking and some response, not a clinically meaningful response yet. So having said that, I think combinatorial therapies will be uh, a normal mainstay of treatment in the future. Uh, many of us are working on combination designs right now, um, different, uh, you know, bispecific carts, et cetera, but also uh, in terms of combinations with uh, PD-1 inhibitors themselves. Um, I think what is gonna be, what is very exciting for our field right now is the potential moving forward um, in the next few years to really see gene editing uh, being applied here and taking the game to the next level. That's something we're hugely excited about, uh, but clearly see a lot of challenges there yet because we still have to get to clinic to demonstrate a convincing proof of concept with the next level of gene editing sophistication. So I do believe that combination therapies will be a reality of means, uh, a mainstay treatment with CAR therapies for certain types of malignancies. Uh, a lot more work yet to be done. Um, as I say, it's a field still in its infancy, but certainly in hematological malignancies, that's where you, you're gonna see the largest body of evidence emerge, I believe in the next three to five years to show convincing, compelling clinical data. And I think you will see a lot more groups get involved, a lot more innovation in this field in terms of combination therapies. That's my, my own feeling. One thing just to, to add, I mean, I think when you talk about combination therapies, a lot of people get scared um, thinking about the economic implications. Yeah. And um, you know, following up on, on Oz's point, I mean, I think it's obvious that you know, anything you can do to make a T cell in a tumor more active is, is probably a good thing for efficacy. And so naturally, you think about um, checkpoint inhibitors. I think, again, because we are taking cells, modifying cells, and putting those cells back into the patient, in principle, we don't need to rely upon existing uh, therapies, the checkpoint inhibitors directly, but instead we can build that in potentially into our product um, directly. And so I think there's recent reports coming out of Penn of using switch receptors to target PD-1, and that just becomes part of the T cell, but gives you the additional functionality that you might have expected through, through combination. So I think we'll increasingly see sort of next generation T cells that bring some of those sort of uh, functional enhancements that might, you might get through combinations, and thereby potentially avoid some of the, um, the, the cost implications on therapy. So 
one of the themes that's already come up a few times is, is the focus on hematologic malignancies where greatest efficacy is being seen, but, but there's obviously a, a huge excitement over the prospect of this becoming a mainstay in therapy in cancer more broadly. What are some of the challenges? Um, there's some science already. There have been some attempts. We've heard Marcella talk about lymph node uh, trafficking and, and the solid tumor challenge, which obviously is a, is a, huge, uh, a huge need that exists. What, what do we know and what types of strategies might be taken probably on a preclinical level to begin with to try and exploit this technology for the, the category of non-hematologic malignancies, to make this something that could be uh, more of a, of, of a main, mainstream therapeutic uh, rather than a, a, perhaps something uh, limited to a subset of hematologic malignancies. Mark. Um, I think so. One of the key things will be finding the right targets for solid tumors. You know, I think in hematologic malignancies, we've been focused on uh, differentiation antigens where the on-target, off-tumor toxicity is manageable, things like, you know, lymphopenia. Uh, and I think that's clearly going to be more challenging in, in solid tumors. I think there are ways um, to get at that. Um, clearly, you know, there's, there's logic-gated approaches where you may need two positive signals from the tumor before the, the CAR T cells optimally fire, or an inhibitory receptor that is uh, recognizing something on a normal uh, tissue that would inhibit the T cell. Um, there's, you know, combinatorial approaches, you know, for things like cancer testis antigens that may be very, you know, specific for the tumor, but also very heterogeneous within the tumor, targeting multiple of those uh, simultaneously uh, may be important. Uh, there's papers looking out at fine-tuning the, the affinity of the receptor for the target to be able to differentiate between normal and tumor. So I think we're really at the very early stages here, but there are a number of different strategies, I think, that we can, we can address that. Um, achieving persistence in the solid tumor setting where there's less available antigen um, can be a challenge. So, you know, things where we can maybe control the proliferation with small molecules or use vaccines to augment them in a low antigen burden setting may be important. Um, picking the right cell population is something we're very focused on, and whether that's the cells that you start with or how you grow and expand and differentiate or skew them in vivo with small molecules or large molecules, I think will be an important uh, area of focus. Um, and then finally, as everyone's been alluding to, the tumor microenvironment and um, figuring out how to test those maybe with combinations, but ultimately, as Chuck was saying, engineer those into the cells, whether that be by gene editing or expression or piggybacking of, of, of nanoparticles on there. I think there's a whole host of things that we, we can try there that I think give us optimism that we can be successful in the solid tumor setting. I wonder if it maybe one of you might define the gene editing piece. I know that terminology has been thrown around a bit, and I'm not sure everybody's entirely familiar with it. So somebody want to just quickly comment on where it, what is it and, and how will it be a benefit to the technology? I, we're, we're talking about fundamentally um, sequence-specific nucleases that can be used to go in, target a specific gene um, uh, in the T cell genome to knock out a gene, for example, um, potentially then create a site for knocking in um, additional payloads. A variety of different technologies um, out there for doing that, probably the, the one that's sort of highest profile right now being CRISPR. And exactly where would that benefit the CAR-T strategy? There, there are a variety of um, sort of uh, concepts out there. I mean, one that's already in the clinic and practice is trying is, uh, for example, using um, a talons to create allogeneic T cells. Um, and so the concept there is that if instead of starting with T cells that come from a patient, you take T cells from a donor, um, those potentially could be therapies, but they're going to be very toxic to a, to a patient. And so if you knock out the T cell receptor in those donor T cells, you ultimately then can render that, um, that T cell safe when you put it into a patient. In addition, you can imagine using gene editing as ways of knocking down uh, signaling pathways that may allow the T cell to be turned off, such that when the T cell gets into the tumor, it's no longer suppressed. So PD-1 as, as an example. Great. So um, one of the issues that, uh, that is essentially a, a, a top-tier concern for essentially all cancer therapy is pricing. And in the case of CAR T cells, the, the bar is thought to be relatively high because it's a high-cost uh, drug, and, uh, and therefore the presumption is that there's got to be very significant benefit at the same time. Um, 
Can you comment on where pricing is likely to be uh, in the nearer term and the longer term? Um, how will CAR-T therapy uh, set itself up from an economic perspective and, and for the investment community and, and for the healthcare industry in general? Not a simple answer, but it's not a it's terribly not a important one. It's a very important question, yes. not a simple one to answer. So in terms of pricing, this is uh, how, you know, certainly we, we look at the, the pricing situation right now. So uh, David, you highlighted very importantly, you are looking at treatments that are in the early days are going to be difficult to manufacture and high cost of goods. That's a given for any company that's developing CAR therapies. The good news is that over a period of time, and I believe over a quick period of time, you're going to start to see improvement in those cost of goods. Um, basically because the, the scaling of these therapies, particularly the raw materials that are used to generate CAR T therapies, will become cheaper because you're creating more volume. Uh, and obviously, the science uh, is getting much more refined. For example, if you look at lentiviral vector technology that we use and others use viral vector platforms, uh, this was an industry that, you know, even five years ago was considered a boutique cottage industry, and now it's becoming uh, a pretty explosive field in terms of scalability uh, and being able to uh, treat many more batches and numbers of cells and patients, therefore. So you will see that cost come down. Nevertheless, there's a reality that uh, initially these treatments will be expensive. You then have to look at the uh, other side of the equation. Well, who are you treating? If you're treating refractory relapsing patients, um, many in the room in the audience will be very familiar with the bone marrow transplant setting and what the cost base is there. Um, there was recent data published at ASH uh, looking at this actual exact topic in terms of what does it truly cost and fully loaded the cost for a patient undergoing a transplant depending on your zip code just in the US can range anywhere from $350,000 all the way up to over a million depending on length of stay, complications, etc. So the standard of care, actually, for these patients is pretty costly, pretty demanding as well from a resource and intensity perspective. Um, now, I'm not saying that CAR-T therapies are going to be priced at that extreme end, but certainly they are going to be more costly than traditional small molecules and biologics to start with. Uh, we uh, and Novartis have not determined a price yet because we typically don't at this stage. We're very excited about the proposition of declaring a price next year. Uh, when we actually hope to file, as are other companies uh, hopefully looking to file their CAR therapies as well in the 2016-17 in the, in the timeframe. So that's what I can say around uh, the, the, the pricing challenge and opportunities here for all, in that if you have a therapy that is going to be truly curative, if it's persistent and durable in response, I think you can have very good health economic and value and payer arguments as to what to position that price at. Clearly, if you have therapies that don't live up to expectations and are not seen as curative, then that's a different equation. And I think that's where the field is moving to now, really demonstrating those real-world evidence sets, if I can call it that, to actually explain to payers and stakeholders what the true cost of therapies are now and what the trade-offs could be with CAR therapies potentially and what benefit can be gained by patients and their payers and providers. I, I would echo that, and, and I think it's just behold on us, given the increased costs and complexity of the administration, that we set the bar very high for ourselves. And so I think clearly if we're not seeing those dramatic effects in phase one, we're not taking that to phase two to do a randomized trial to show an incremental benefit in terms of progression for your overall survival. We're going back you know, to the laboratory and back to phase one to try to create therapies that can do that. You know, so, so clearly I think there's an incremental cost to the healthcare system if you're bridging to transplant. But what we aspire to, again, is to replace transplant. I think once you get to that, you're able to demonstrate that sufficient efficacy that now you're replacing instead of bridging. Um, you're actually you know, able to charge something that's fair and save the healthcare system money. Um, in terms of the cost of goods, you know, I think clearly now, um, you know, if you look historically, some of these cellular therapies have had you know, cost of goods on the order of 70%. You know, we're investing very heavily in things like automation. Uh, we're investing heavily in characterizing both our process and our product so that when we do make uh, changes in the technology about how we manufacture these cells, we don't necessarily need to repeat all the clinical data. We can show comparability based on having a well-characterized process. Um, and so I think these things, you know, as we get to economies of scale and more experience, the cost of goods should drop dramatically so that we're able to do this at prices that are not substantially higher than they are for expensive, uh, you know, biologics. 
But if I could just ask, I, I fundamentally agree with that conclusion, but I think it, it, it is worth remembering that, that we're talking about autologous cell therapy, which has certain um, components that um, will always be part of cost of goods unless the regulatory framework changes. So in particular, the, the challenges of having the, dealing with logistics of take, taking patient cells, getting them to a manufacturing site, tracking them in that site, and then getting the cells back to patient is something obviously you don't have to do if you're making an uh, antibody in a bottle. Um, similarly, you know, each, each patient is a separate batch, and each batch needs pretty sophisticated uh, testing. Um, and, and you essentially have to bear all of those testing costs on that single single patient's batch. Um, so I think you know those are th those are realities. The cost of goods will be um, will, you know will be higher than what you might expect for other therapies. That said, I think there's enormous room for bringing down cost of goods as we go from essentially what were academic manufacturing processes where cost of goods scalability was not a key concern to ultimately making true commercial products. There's there's enormous opportunity for improvement. Just to give some examples, I think, for example, the number of T cells in an apheresis are probably sufficient to generate a product without even having to expand them. So currently, you know, most of the expansion process is on the order of a week or two weeks to make the cells. But I think as we get more efficient, we can probably do that from a single apheresis. Or similarly, if you do some expansion, you might have enough cells um, in a, you know, in a single, in a simple blood draw rather than apheresis, particularly if we start emphasizing expansion in vivo it's, instead of ex vivo expansion, which probably makes even a more effective product because we know the longer we manipulate these cells ex vivo, the less potent in, in vivo efficacy they have. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's benefits potentially from both cost as well as efficacy by, uh, by making some of these technology improvements. I think a little bit of the costs of goods may also be, um, changing as we develop next generation cars. So um, there is kind of a, a movement to develop uh, automated manufacturing where perhaps it could be done at the point of care and over the course of one or two days instead of a seven to 10 day manufacturing period, um, which is really, I think, where a lot of the cost comes in. And it's also where a lot of the logistics issues come in. Um, so if there were point of care ways to manufacture and, and deliver CAR T cells, that would be, uh, that's one potential direction. Um, that could reduce cost. Another is the development of these off-the-shelf uh, CAR T cells that, um, that you already introduced uh, in terms of having one lot that can treat multiple patients. Um, that does, we don't completely understand the biology around that yet, and I think in some ways solving logistics is a little easier than solving uh, big biology questions, um, but I think it's, it's also the uh, potential wave of the future. So just to build off of Marcella's point there, so the challenge we have is that um, the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of maturing in the regulatory thinking around this space. So, and it's been a, a fascinating journey for many of us in the field that the, the agencies, uh, particularly in the US FDA, Japan, Europe, they are very, um, very wanting of these therapies. They want to see these kind of innovations brought through. I mean, a number of companies have breakthrough designation. We have it. A uh, number of other companies have attained this for uh, CAR T therapies in the making. But there is a reality that the process that we have now are, um, Mark pointed this out, they uh, are, are to an extent manual, uh, requires um, automation and other things that are happening. But also convincing regulators of a framework to approve these products in the first place that are not small molecules, they're not biologics, I think is going to form a, a level of a beachhead, if I can call it that, to allow some of these fantastic ideas that in a few years' time we may be able to um, uh, do well in terms of point of care models. I think that's a few years away. And on the allogeneic side, um, I think that's uh, something again for the future, great vision and hope. If we can overcome the issues of graft versus host disease and some of these other challenges, uh, great potential therapies in the future, but some years away yet. I think the, the regulatory framework is, is changing, partly because uh, there is now industry uh, involvement. There's many more INDs that have been filed in the last year than there were probably in the last uh, 10 years before that. Um, and, and some of the costs actually are because of some of the regulatory framework. So testing to make sure that there's no replication competent vector left over is something that's, that's pretty costly. And I think once we develop a lot of data, there's been more than 200 uh, patients treated with, with CAR T cells. These are not approved therapies, by the way. This is all still uh, investigational. But as we collect these data, um, both in the short, short term from manufacturing and in the long term from, from follow-up, it may be that some of those requirements start to decrease, um, which will also bring down costs. 
an interesting question uh, that was uh, contributed by a member of the audience, uh, sort of a provocative concept, is the question of whether CAR T cell therapy may uh, in some instances be potentially capable of producing epitope spreading. Um, epitope spreading is where an initial immune or inflammatory response is directed against a specific antigen, but then because of the inflammatory microenvironment, um, additional immune targeting occurs. This is commonly uh, studied in, in, in the autoimmune space and thought to be responsible largely for autoimmunity. Um, is it possible that uh, being exquisitely specific about a single antigen in, in the case of engineered T cells, that there may be ways of broadening the immune repertoire um, as, a, as a component of CAR T therapy? So we've seen that actually start to happen already um, with mesothelin-directed CAR T cells in patients with mesothelioma and pancreatic cancer. Um, where we see not necessarily a, a huge clinical response directly from the CAR T cells, but we see this expansion in the T cell repertoire um, that is specific to, uh, to tumor antigens uh, present in the tumor. So I think there, the proof of concept that that happens is, is there. I think it may not be necessary for some of the hematologic malignancies, um, but I think that may be one of the mechanisms where CAR T is going to be a platform for solid tumor. Obviously, you can then just flip it around and say, so what is the risk associated with epitope spreading if it will be happening at the same time? Um, is, is there potential toxicity? Has that already been seen, or are there concerns about that? To my knowledge, I haven't seen it, <laughs> in, certainly in the data that we've seen, but it's a, it's a theoretical risk that you're highlighting. Uh, but clearly, early days, as I say, for this field, and a lot more to understand still on these, which is why persistence durability data getting long-term outcomes is going to be very, very important for patients and uh, care providers to be reassured that this is a definitive pillar that could form a, a substantial uh, benefit in the future. Right now, most of the protocols exclude patients with a history of prior autoimmune disease um, because we are activating the T cells and uh, even just with stimulated T cells being put back in, there's, there's this potential risk of autoimmune disease. So, I think it's going to be hard to tell with these initial wave of, of trials, but once the therapy gets more broadly used um, and there are patients who may, ha who, who may have a history of autoimmune disease um, start to be candidates for this kind of therapy, that I think is some, an area that we should investigate to find out if there's toxicity there. I, mean, I think the greatest risk is really with the novel receptors that we introduce into the cells because sure. they haven't gone through you know, thymic uh, education. Um, and so whether it's a T cell receptor or a new CAR uh, binding domain, I think that's where the, where the greatest risk is. I think when you're, if you're activating the endogenous immune system, you know, I think those T cell receptors have in general gone through thymic education. And so I think the risk there is less, but, but certainly not existent, particularly if we start introducing other agents such as checkpoints to, to further unleash the immune system. I think that's really where the risk goes up. Great. So one of the important questions in terms of uh, scalability and, and ultimately bringing this into the mainstream of, of therapy is the question of whether the manufacturing and the, the engineering, the process of ultimately producing the drugs, um, what will the role of the academic center be? Is this likely something that some of it may reside in the academic center? Will it occur in more centralized industry? run operations, a hybrid of, of those two. What are your thoughts of, of where this will actually reside? Where will it happen? Well, I think for, from our perspective, I think for commercialization, it's likely in the near to intermediate um, term at least that the manufacturing will be centralized. And I think it's not so much just the manufacturing, which we're beginning to automate, um, but I think as Chuck pointed out, a, a large part of the cost and actually the, the more uh, educated, um, you know, uh, personnel that that are required are the quality control folks that do the assays around product release because every single product uh, needs to be, you know, checked for sterility, potency, uh, identity, et cetera. Um, so, but I think there will be a very robust role for the academic centers in exploring questions. You know, I have to say, even I was just telling Marcel, even just six months ago, I was thinking as we got our own manufacturing online, I was thinking. We're going to support academic trials, but we're going to want to do all the manufacturing for these trials with our academic collaborators. And there are just so many questions to be asked that we can't possibly do the manufacturing for all of them. And I think for a lot of these kind of uh, longer-term, higher-risk projects, exploring new targets 
Um, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, for the academic centers, for us to support the academic centers to do their own manufacturing, to ask some of these questions and validate them. And those most promising ones then get, get brought in-house for, uh, for a commercial process that inherently takes longer to do because the bar is just higher for industry versus academics. I would agree with Mark. I think for the, for the foreseeable future and certainly going into the next decade, it's going to be centralized manufacturing with very strong interdependencies as they currently exist with academic medical centers. I mean, let's face it, we got into this field through a partnership with the University of Pennsylvania as a primary academic institution, and we still do a lot of development work on site with Bruce Levine and his colleagues there uh, as, as, uh, at, a, at a cell processing uh, setup that is GMP enabled. But in terms of scaling and throughput for commercialization, that's something Clearly, we will have a responsibility as uh, the holders of that ultimate label to and show a chain of custody, end-to-end -end control, safety, long-term follow-up. These are going to be um, you know, our obligations under uh, any approval setting. So I think it will be centralized manufacturing. I think the next decade, who knows? Uh, a lot of innovation going to happen in point of care, allergenic therapies. It could be another transformation and wave of transformation, but I think uh, for now certainly it's going to be centralized manufacturing for autologous therapies. So we're down to our last two minutes or so, and I thought maybe what I would do is, um, is just run through uh, and ask each of our panelists to say, we're looking at, what, what is this, version 1.01 or 1.00. Um, what will version 2, 3, and 4 look like in a quick 20, 30 second uh, dream uh, for each of you? Um, what, what will the field of CAR-T therapy look like five years, 10 years from now, do you think? Maybe I'll start. Okay, so it's gonna be like the iPhone. Uh, in five years time, we're gonna be sitting here and we're gonna be talking about the uh, version uh, X.6 or whatever. Um, I think we will have moved uh, into capturing a uh, broader base of uh, hematologic malignancies. And I think we're gonna to start to see some success with solid tumors. I think uh, physician control of cell expansion or expression of other transgenes, I think, will be critical. I think small molecules that allow us to do that, so particularly things like cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity, we can really control that uh, rather than just be a function of the degree of tumor burden. Uh, I think really optimizing the cell population uh, will be critical. And then finally, introducing some of these things that can modulate the tumor microenvironment. I think those will be the three major things from my perspective that will be uh, critical. Yeah, it's, it's hard to add more to that, but I would say T cells that can recognize more than one antigen so that we can uh, expand the, the repertoire of potential antigens that can be targeted and therefore the, the kinds of tumors that can be targeted, uh, and gene edited uh, T cells that are either checkpoint resistant or deliver a new uh, drug or cytokine or stimulation to the tumor microenvironment. Uh, like the iPhone, I think it's going to be very different in many different parameters. But if I just pick two, I would say safety. We really haven't talked a lot about safety, but I do think you know the safety of current generation cars you know, is um, is limiting their their potential uh, application. And I think we will find ways to to address some of the potential safety concerns around T cell therapies. The second um, I would see is is sort of really looking out there are ways of combining sort of adaptive immune responses and coupling those to T cells in ways that you're not locked into a single target co concept of combining vaccines together with uh, modified CAR Ts, I think uh, can, can really unlock a lot of indications. Great, well, thank you very much. I want to thank our panelists and, and everybody else who's contributed questions.